So we're looking at our, our first um, video leading up to our lab, and this lab is um, looking at vitals, a vital assessment, and uh, it's going to incorporate heart rate. Um, part of the vitals assessment is blood pressure, but that's uh, video number two. So when we look at um, our vital signs, we have um, temperature, respiratory rate, pulse, heart rate, and blood pressure. And so we're going to be looking at one, two, and three in this uh, uh, video, and then we'll be looking at blood pressure in the, uh, the next. So when we look at temperature, <clears throat> we have um, qualitative assessment, so just palpating extremities, so touching someone's arm or leg or feeling their forehead. The reason why you'd be uh, feeling their arm or leg is just, just to kind of check if it's cool or warm based on blood flow. You can do quantitative assessment and use a thermometer. That's how we normally think of, um, of body temperature measurement. Um, usually a, th a thermometer in the, in the mouth, uh, in the ear canal, um, rectal, which is the most accurate. So that's what we'll be doing uh, next week. Just kidding. Um, and what's becoming really popular now is temporal. So either like a, a wand that's waved across the face or we have those infrared uh, lasers that um, give us our instant read on our thermometer or our temperature. So 98.6 is the number that we always think of, but um, anything below 199.5 to 96.8. Um, as we get older, uh, aka as our metabolism slows down, our t uh, temperature is usually a little lower. Uh, it's affected by age, circadian rhythm. So circadian rhythm is your sleep cycles and um, uh, the time that you go to bed, your emotional levels, exercise. So everything affects your temperature. Um, decreases in core body temp indicates lower metabolic or impaired thyroid function. And in fact, before thyroid testing was popular, um, a, a, a daily assessment of, of body temperature was uh, the best way to assess a thyroid dysfunction. So there's not much that we do with temperature. If anything over 100 degrees, you have a fever. Um, but it's good to know, look at your metabolic aspect and see how hot your furnace is and see how well your fuel is burning. Respiration is another one that we will talk about. It's involved more in cardiovascular assessment, but you're basically measuring the breathing weight of your, of your patient or client. And this is the process of a gas exchange for uh, oxygen for carbon dioxide. One respiration, one breath cycle is one breathing in, so one inspiration and one expiration. Uh, breathing rate for adults is about 12 to 20 beats per minute. Or, I'm sorry, um, respirations per minute. Um, children breathe a little faster and infants breathe even faster, 30 to 50. So almost three to threefold um, the adults. Um, not just looking at the quantity of respirations, but the, the character or the quality uh, refers to the depth. Um, so are they deep, are they deep, deep breathing? One of the things you will be doing a lot as a, as a fitness professional is noticing where breathing is occurring from. Are they belly breathing, like pure abdominal diaphragmatic breathing, or are they chest breathing? And during high intensity exercises, you will be expanding through your chest, but at rest, you should be breathing mostly from your belly. And, um, are you breathing through your mouth? Are you breathing through your nose? Is your inhale longer than your exhale or vice versa? So there's a lot to respiration beyond just breath. And the quantity of breath is, again, this is a medical system aspect. They always kind of measure that. But um, there's so much more that we can do with this that we'll talk about in the cardiorespiratory uh, aspect. But some of the words that they will use for the character respirations are like labored or strenuous or difficult, abnormal sounding. Um, one of the things you want to make sure is your equal spacing between the breaths, right? If there's regular or irregular. Um, and any of these signs, irregular, rapid breathing, slow breathing, weird noises, these are all like red flags. These are some of the terms that are used for the abnormal respiration. So dyspnea is difficult or labored. Apnea, like uh, this usually happens at night. Uh, tachypenia is rapid. Bradypenia is slow. And then orthopenia, I'm just going to take a minute right here because this, this pops up in our fitness assessment for uh, lifestyle pre-activity screening. Um, this is the like severe shortness of breath when someone is, is in a, uh, a horizontal position, like laying down. So the problem is, is that respirations are on partially voluntary control. It's one of the few uh, mechanisms that have both involuntary and voluntary, and so you can control it. So if you're getting your heart rate assessed, you can't really tell your heart to speed up or slow down directly but you can with your breathing. And so once clients become aware that you are 
checking their breathing, um, it becomes hard to actually assess it. And as we play around with breathing rate in our lab, you will find that it is difficult to do. So you kind of have to play a little trickery and um, you have to uh, make them think that you're assessing something else. So you'll, um, you'll keep your hand on the pulse like you're taking the heart rate, but you're really checking breathing. So now every time you go to the doctor, you know the trick that nurses are playing when they are assessing you, and then you can mess with them and like do some irregular breathing, some labored, and see what kind of reaction you get. Um, how we as fitness professionals will most likely use breathing besides the um, assessment of breathing through the belly, through the chest, is this thing called the talk test. And it's the ability to talk during activity. Um, during exercise, you have increased oxygen demands, and so your breathing uh, is required. Um, it is actually the best measure of respiration is the ability to talk during activity, right? And if you can talk, that means that you're not really strenu uh, uh, per perceive the exercise as strenuous. And if you're able to talk, you aren't really going hard enough. And it's kind of a secret in the fitness industry how we get our clients to shut up if they are yapping too much. The next picture, uh, the next slide I have here is a picture of the ven ventilator thresholds here. And this gray line down here shows the breathing rate. And this blue line here shows the volume of air going in with each breath. And you can see that as we, in this um, exercise intensity is at the bottom here, so as we move to the right, our exercise intensity gets higher and higher. So we're running faster and faster and doing more and more work. You can actually see that breathing rate actually drops as we progress and then rapidly increases. And the reason why it drops when we are increasing exercise is because um, we go from belly breathing to chest breathing and we are almost doubling the amount of volume, tripling the volume of air coming in. And that that mechanism, that shift from belly breathing to chest breathing is more oxygen than our body actually needs. And so our breathing rate actually slows a little bit. So this is the range here where your breathing rate is slow enough where you're can have, can carrying a conversation. And at this point where it skyrockets, you're the, it's hard to get a word in otherwise. And at this point right here is when your body went from an aerobic state to an anaerobic state or went from moderate intensity exercise to um, high intensity exercise. So it's kind of a neat little quick and dirty way to tell how hard someone is, is working. So now heart rate, unlike respiration and temperature, we're going to use quite a bit. Um, we're going to look at some of the terms and some of the ranges that we are expecting with this. So the heart rate itself is the number of times a heart contracts in a time period. It's usually expressed in 60 seconds. It doesn't have to be a 60 second interval uh, in terms of its assessment. It's always expressed in a 60 second, but a lot of times people will just do like a 30 second interval and multiply it by two, or they'll do it by 15 seconds and multiply it by four. The shorter the interval, the more opportunity for error you're gonna get involved there. So if you just do it for 10 seconds and multiply it by six, um, that's not going to be as accurate as maybe doing it for like three minutes and dividing it for, for by three. So you're getting an average of three minutes of, of assessment. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's always going to be expressed in a 60 second interval in beats per minute. The longer you go, the more accurate your number is going to be. Um, heart rate is thought to be an indicator of cardiovascular endurance. It tends to be lower as you become more aerobically fit. And the reason why this is happening is kind of similar to the tidal volume with the, the breathing aspect is that e the heart becomes so strong that for each contraction of the heart, it's ejecting more blood into the circulatory system that it doesn't have to beat as fast to get the same cardiac output. That in itself has led to this misnomer that, that, oh, the lower the heart rate, the better, the more fit you are. There's really no correlation between lowered heart rate and athletic performance. Um, it merely is a physiological marker or indicator of how much stress is being placed in the body. Um, remember, it's the working muscles that are the metabolic hogs. They are the ones that are demanding or placing uh, demands on the heart for its resources. It needs glucose, it needs nutrients, it has waste products, it, it needs oxygen. So it's the working muscles that are uh, there. So how we use heart rate is a measure of exercise intensity. How hard are you working? And not how hard your heart's working. We know your heart can handle it. It's how hard is the metabolic musculoskeletal system working. 
So the normal resting pulse for an adult is 60 to 100 beats per minute. So anything below 60 and everything, anything over 100, we want to investigate a little bit. But this is resting heart rate. So this is at total rest. You will regularly get your heart ab above 100 beats per minute with any type of daily activity or just a walk or a flight of stairs. Um, your expected range is 60 to 80. So if you were to measure 100 people, 90% of them will be in 60 to 80 range. And if they are higher than that, it's normal, but we want to find out what's going on. Um, infants have a higher heart rate, just like they had a higher breathing rate. And as we get older, our heart uh, slows down. Um, these terms, Brady and tacky, are similar to what we saw with the breathing. Brady means slow, tacky means fast. So when you have pulse rates below 60, um, there might be some cardiovascular aspect. You could be some yoga guru who knows how to lower their heart rate. You could be an endurance athlete, or you can just be a small individual that doesn't need that much blood flow. The only issue with low uh, heart rates like this is that you are, are you getting sufficient amount of blood, aka oxygen, to the brain? And so if someone's heart rate is below 60 and they're dizzy and lightheaded, there's something going on. If they feel fine, eh, there's nothing going on, most likely. Um, tachycardia, when it's truly at rest, um, probably some stress. So, um, so just some quick facts. Uh, again, it just kind of reinforces that they can vary um, and they do not predict athletic performance. So just keep that in mind that someone with a high resting heart rate is not unfit and someone with a low resting heart rate is uh, fit. It tends to be that way, but not always the case. So the absolute best time to determine resting heart rate is before you even get out of bed. So you have a stopwatch or you have a pulse oximeter or some device to measure heart rate and you are doing it right away and um, you probably want to get a few measures and this truly gets your baseline uh, resting heart rate. And just to show how much variation there is, is that my true resting heart rate where I, when I'm in bed is like 71, between 68 and 71. But if you were to measure like my heart rate right now and I'm sitting and I'm just talking and doing a lecture, it's like probably 101, 102, and it's not stress or strenuous. It's just the amount of activity that my body is doing. Um, your resting heart rate is a good way of determining how much residual stress you have. So if my heart rate normally being in its 70s, if I wake up one morning and my heart rate before even doing much is already in the 90s, I know something's up. I either didn't get a good night's sleep or I train too hard or I'm getting sick or, or something. But, um, the, the, it, it truly is a window into the body's stress level. So that was resting heart rate. Now we're going to get into this concept of max heart rate. And max heart rate is the, is basically how fast can your heart beat and not blow up and die, right? That's basically what it is. Uh, the reason why it's important to us is not because we want to know how much we can handle, is that it becomes the basis for our targeted physiological training zones. So we want to hit a certain exercise intensity so that we elicit specific physiological responses. Um, theoretically, just for fun, it's the point at which the heart goes uh, working aerobically to where it's going to go anaerobically, and the body does everything in its power to stop that. And so instead of... Um, what it does is it basically impairs the, the muscle's ability to produce force so that although you think you're running as fast as you can, you're only running two miles an hour because you're tired. Um, max heart rate gets tricky. It is, uh, it can be uh, assessed. It's, if, if anyone's ever had a stress test or had a family member that had a stress test, um, that is a max heart rate test. They're basically putting you on a treadmill, seeing how much you can handle, and you stop, uh, because if you couldn't go any further, you're going to fly off the back of the treadmill. Um, the way that we do most of our tests, we have the ability to do a graded exercise test, but most of it's done submax testing, but where most of it's done is in this quick and dirty uh, calculation by age, right? And um, you probably already have heard this formula before, 220 minus the age. And this is a formula that was devised by uh, Fox and Haskell in the 1970s and never ever was intended to be a as popular as it was, but this has kind of been the gold standard. I just want to bring your attention that it has a standard, a standard estimate of almost 10 to 15 um, beats per minute. So that sucks. Like That's horrible, but it's super easy to remember. It's 220 minus the age. Um, how bad it sucks is that 67% of the population will fall within 10 to 15 beats of the formula. So okay. 
and that 95% of the population will be almost double or half 40 to 60 of that, right? So in other words, one third of your clients will fall within 10 to 15, uh, one out of 20, maybe 20 or 30 beats from that. So it's it has a lot of variability. And then the next chart we're going to show you is we can see that these best fit lines, these linear approach to this, you can have someone that's 75 years old that has the same max heart rate as a 19 year old, right? So there's some decline with age. You can kind of see that trend here with the lines, but you can see a lot of intervariability behind that. So um, in, I don't remember what year, I think it was like 2007 or 2008, but uh, Tanaka came up with a formula that has been uh, accepted and pretty well validated. And it's instead of 220 minus the age, it's 208 minus 70% of the age. It's still not as good, but it's it's better. It has a, a standard error estimate of six beats per minute. But the math on it is not as nice, right? 220 minus the age, you can do it. It's a subtraction problem, no problem. Here, you got to take 70% of your age and then subtract. So you got to do some fractions, some percentages. and But it's a better formula. And if, and when, if I use it, I tend to use this formula because now, right, we have phones with us and do the calculation real quick. Um, and if your age is a round number, it's, it's easy to do in your head. The reason why we get the max heart rate is we're trying to get this target heart rate. So now this is the third heart rate we've talked about. We talked about resting heart rate, which is your heart rate at rest. You have your max heart rate, which is the maximum, right? And then you now have the target heart rate, which is a specific loading parameter, a certain level of, of effort that you want so that you can elicit physiological responses. It's, it's a basis for the exercise prescription. It's how we communicate with uh, the client or with other practitioners. It's how we track client progress. And then the, the, the determinant of exercise intensity, the indicator of what physiological response we can expect, what training effect are we getting or trying to get. So then we get back to this graph that I said we were going to revisit. Here is your effort, and then this is the effect. This is the physiological outcome, right? And here are the light activity. This is that physical activity that doesn't do much. It does fat burning because that's really all it's doing is it's utilizing fat if you haven't eaten any sugar or carbohydrate prior to that. And then where we want is to be in this orange zone, right? The orange theory fitness. And in this case, this image is gold. So the Goldilocks just right. Not too much, not too little. So the target heart rate is calculated as a range of 50 to 100 percent intensity, but 60 to 85 percent is the most common. So if I back up one slide again, you'll see that this this range here is where most of exercise prescription is happening. Um, the target heart rate is calculated off of the max heart rate. So um, it's based off of either the Fox and Haskell pro, uh, formula, 220 minus the age, or the Tanaka. You can choose, right? You're going to get similar numbers. And um, just for clarification, 100% um, intensity would it always be the max, right? There's no such thing as 110% in physiology. It could be in math and other aspects, but 100% is full maximal capacity. And um, there's two ways of calculating target heart rate. Um, in each of these methods, there's an element called intensity or effort, which is ex which is expressed as a percentage of a max. So you're basically taking a percentage of your max heart rate. So if you want 65% intensity, you would take 65% of your max heart rate, and that number is your target to get your heart rate to a certain goal, right? If you wanted 85%, so um, it's 85% of either this formula or this one. You pick, doesn't matter. You're going to do both in class for for um, for practice, but that's one method. And there's there's a second method that we're going to talk about here. So you can kind of see here that there's a tendency for uh, heart rate to decline with age, and that the different exercise intensities have different physiological outcomes. These are those and a little bit more specific in terms of uh, what it feels like. So you can have more of a qualitative component with it. Um, how long these durations last, like two to 10 minutes versus five. So these are like sprint intervals, right? And this is like a jog or a run. So for method one, basic target heart rate, this is straight up just basic math. Um, you want 65% intensity. You calculated max heart rate somehow, some way. In this case, we were doing the um, uh, Fox and Haskell, so 220 minus the age. 65% of 220 minus the age, 180. 
117 beats per minute. So this would be your moderate intensity exercise. Your vigorous intensity, 85%, 220 minus the age, so 85% of 180, 153 beats per minute. So this is what you would use for your um, for your um, moderate exercise intensity. This is what you'd use for your high intensity. That would be your target. Okay. Basic math. Your second method is called the Carvonen method, or sometimes referred to as the heart rate reserve method. So we already acknowledged that there's some variability amongst age. So not all 40 year olds are going to have the same um, physiological resources. We saw in the one chart that a, a 75 year old had the equivalent resources of the of 19 year old. The, this method assumes that some of the variability can be teased out of someone's base level. In this case, they use resting heart rate. So since the range is 60 to 100, your resting heart rate is a window to how much stress that your body's already kind of exposed to. So instead of taking the percentage of the actual max heart rate, you're taking a percentage of the max heart rate minus the resting heart rate. You calculate your intensity and then you add that number back in. So it's just a little quick, same thing. You're taking a percentage of the max, but instead of taking it on the full max heart rate, you're just, just taking the percentage on the max heart rate minus the resting heart rate, doing your percentage and then adding it back in. So it's just one or two extra, extra steps. So for um, our 40 year old individual that had the max rate of 180 and a resting heart rate of 70, now instead of just doing, I should have done 65% here, sorry, but let's do 85%. 85% before they had 174 beats per minute, but now that we took, instead of taking 85% of 180 and getting 174, we're taking 85% of 110. So we took 180 minus 70, then did 85% of that, and then added 70 back to the mix. So that's basically those two methods. So these are your targets, right? Just keep in mind that um, these target heart rates, oops, sorry. Keep in mind that these target heart rates are just starting points. There is variability and these are used to calculate just general aspect. It's not a hard and fast saying that you can never go above 163 beats per minute. What you're going to be basing it on is client response, outcomes, and physiological. If they feel like crap, eh, you might be going too hard. If they feel like nothing's going on at all, well, that you might not be going hard enough. So again, these are starting points that kind of put you in the right direction, but you still have to use your clinical judgment and you still have to use best uh, evidence-based practice when taking in your client or patient's outcomes as well. So that's target heart rate, max heart rate, and resting heart rate. So now how the heck do we uh, measure this and assess this? So um, the most common way, because it's you don't need anything but a stopwatch, is uh, palpation of the pulse. So you're putting your fingers on their wrist or their neck or some other part of their body and you are measuring the pulse wave, the pressure wave that you're feeling through your fingers. You can use a, a stethoscope and listen to the heart and every ba bump ba bump ba bump every lub dub is one beat per minute. Um, a big, big move about in the last 10 years, but not as popular anymore are the heart rate monitors. So on the, you have them on the devices now where they pick it up and that's usually actually using the pulse method when you're touching that and it, like an EKG type thing. But they have these uh, telemetry straps that pick up a little bit of the EKG from the surface of the heart and then transmit that to a receiver. You can do an EKG where they're also picking up more specifically the electrical conduction of the heart through the skin. And then the most popular one now um, is the pulse oximeter, and mostly because the price of these has dropped down. So basically what a pulse oximeter is, is a little thing, a little device you put on your finger. It takes a one AA battery or AAA battery, and it has a little infrared laser that um, shoots into your nail bed, and it's giving you what it's really used for is to give you your oxygen saturation. So in this picture here, this guy's got a, a oxygen saturation of 98%. And most people are going to be between 95 and 100, 100. Anything below 90, we know there's some issues. So what's really cool about this device is that when someone's working out, you can see if they're really tired or short of breath. You can see if they're really short of breath, right? Like, oh, you know, it's an oxygen deficiency thing or they're just being a wimp. 
Um, what it does too, it gives you a near instant read of your pulse. And so you're working out with someone and you want to get a heart rate, I'm not going to touch their sweaty hand and try to count for 30 seconds. I'm just going to throw this on their finger. And as long as there's appropriate blood flow and, and their temperature is warm enough, you're going to get a, an instant read, right? Where this becomes issues is when you have like a really older patient, like seven, late 70s and higher, and they haven't been doing anything and they have really crappy circulation in their hands and they're not going to get a, a, a read right away. It also doesn't work well with nail polish. So if someone has nail polish on, you might need to find a different way. But for 25 bucks, um, these are, are great devices. And I think I have a, I have a link um, that in the, in the notes for these lectures for an Amazon. Um, Santa Monica makes a good brand. It is, I, I have like three of them. I have them all over the place. And I use them all the time, all the time. So the pulse, uh, which is the palpation method, which is the quick and dirty one that's non-equipment based, is um, is, a, is a series of these pressure waves. So every time the heart's contracting, it's ejecting a, a bolus of blood into the circulatory system. And that, that, that surge is cumulative. And every time the heart beats, you get a surge of blood, surge of blood. And the blood vessels kind of expand with that surge of blood and then contract back down. So will you be using that for a blood pressure assessment, but you can actually feel that in the arteries during the heart contraction. So every time the heart bumps um, at some of the surface ar arteries, you can feel that. So there are nine areas in the body where you can assess pulse, uh, up at the temporal, the carotid, um, at the uh, brachial artery, um, and it continues down here to the wrist, within the femoral artery, and all the way down. Two most common spots are the carotid artery here and the brachial artery here. And uh, the brachial artery is the most common if the person can uh, uh, tolerate it. Uh, if they can't for whatever reason because of some like venous issue or, or sensitivity to the arm, um, they can go elsewhere. Uh, children are usually assessed down in the lower area, infants like the thigh or the leg. And then the carotid artery is common in CPR type components. So these are the nine spots. Like I said, the two most common are the radial and the carotid. So the uh, radial artery is um, the same side as the thumb side. So if you're palpating here by the pinky side, you're in the wrong spot. So always look for the thumb part. Um, I um, just have to warn you is that your palpation skills um, less is more when it comes to pressure. So what ends up happening is that you push down and you can't feel anything. And then the, the, the first reaction is for people to push even harder. And what you really need to do is the opposite is you actually got to lighten up your touch a little bit. And usually when you lighten your touch is when you tend to feel the pulse better. Now you don't see it in this picture here, but the radial artery does continue on into the thumb. And it's a pretty, pretty powerful pulse. And the reason they warn you not to use your thumb is that it, you're touching light enough it's hard to delineate between what's your pulse and what's their pulse so you don't use your assessment with the thumb try to use your uh, two fingers instead so this is showing like hand over wrist aspect me personally and we're going to show this demonstrate this in the lab when we meet again i prefer to cup the hand and kind of go hand over wrist and whether their palm is down or palms up I tend to like this position uh, better, but it's just a preference. It doesn't mean it's better. It's just my preference. The carotid pulse we um, pick here, it's um, if you find the angle of the jaw right here, you kind of drop down in a little nook between your Adam's apple, your cartilage there, and your, uh, you can see this muscle bulge right here. You kind of see it right there. That's the sternal cleidomastoid. And in between there is where the carotid artery lies. And you'll find it's pretty, pretty strong pulse. Um, this is one you do to yourself or to an unconscious uh, victim that's uh, suffering a stroke or injury or is going to receive CPR. Um, it is invasive and uh, it's not comfortable. We'll play around with it on uh, Thursday for our lab. And you'll see what it feels like to have someone jam their fingers into your throat. Um, the carotid artery is also the artery that you use when you want to choke someone out. So don't do both sides at the same time. Uh, to prevent anyone from uh, from fainting. So again, you can see the amount of pressure you need to get through to get through the chin. And uh, same thing, just under the angle of the jaw, light pressure, nothing too crazy. Uh, remember, less is more. And those are your two main ways of uh, assessing pulse if you're not using a pulse oximeter or some other device.
So heart rate is a window to your stress levels, thus anything that you per perceive as a stimulus, whether it's chemical like caffeine or drugs or excitement, um, a lack of sleep can uh, change the heart rate. Um, there's a syndrome called white coat syndrome, aka anxiety, just the stress response from knowing that someone's going to be looking at you or assessing you or putting you on stage. So the last slide I have here is looking at the uh, cardiac output. And I know I've mentioned in this lecture and a few other lectures that the working muscles are the largest recipient of that cardiac output. And so you can see here that at rest, they um, compete with the digestive system at rest in terms of their blood flow. And you can see that during heavy exercise, your cardiac output is going from five liters per minute. So for every minute, your heart is pushing out basically two two liter bottles of Coke and one liter bottle of, uh, of water. And at cardiac output, you're almost putting out um, five gallons of blood per minute that your heart's pumping through. And almost 85% of that is going to your working muscle, right? So it just shows that the heart is a servant to the working muscles and it's the working muscles that are putting the metabolic demand for the cardiovascular system. So that's it. That's the um, heart rate aspect. We'll be doing this in lab and uh, we'll be assessing heart rate and we'll look at different positions standing and seated and we'll also use pulse oximeter to see how we can manipulate our heart rate through breathing to immediately drop that by like 10 beats per minute. So we'll have a pretty fun lab with such a simple aspect.